All right, no worries. All right, we are live. Uh, greetings, lords and ladies from America to India and to we had we had a couple people further than India. I think we had somebody in Hong Kong uh, at one point and beyond and back again. I'm joined today by David and Judah, and uh, so. David is a friend of mine with actual real-world experience in filmmaking. He holds some truly unique perspectives on the art form. We've gotten to work a little bit together, and I've always treasured our conversations and David's input on narrative storytelling, whether it comes in the form of gaming, the written word, or what ends up on the uh, big screen. So we're going to have a discussion today. A few, I guess it was about a month ago or so, David sent me this uh, email and we just started going back and forth. And I really liked the substance of uh, David's email. So we're going to discuss that today. Uh, we're going to be ranging from topics of creativity to surviving in the modern world and how to fit all of our basket of pastimes and interests and creative compulsions into the real world and uh, just have some conversations about that. A lot of it uh, goes back to a specific essay from David Foster Wallace uh, that I couldn't remember the name of. I think I was having a chat with Improbable One on one of our podcasts, uh, one of our uh, most vocal viewers, and and I couldn't remember the name of this essay. Uh, and so David did in this email. And uh, so, we're, so David's going to share some thoughts from that today, and I'm going to pick his brain a bit about that. We're going to pick each other's brains. And Jude is here to, as as usual, um, you know, call Mr. Ford Icarus back down to earth with some reality. Um, I've had more than one Hulkic, Icarian, uh, Pyrrhic fall this week, so... Uh, so I think I think I'll, I think I'm in a good place to have a decent conversation. This collapsed the entire history of Western mythology into like one sentence. <laughs> Icarus to the Hulk. Icarus to the Hulk. Yeah, it's just like a daily thing for me. Um, let's throw Spider Man in there maybe too, and Tigger. Spider Man and Tigger. That's the other the other sides. Um, how are y'all doing this week? Judah. Uh, um, I am pretty mediocre. <laughs> That's good, man. That's the dream. <laughs> Dude, around here, is it the same for you guys? Around here, everyone says, when you ask them how they're doing, live in the dream. Live yes. in the dream. Is that like unanimous? What's that? People don't tell me that. Okay. <laughs> it's like a thing at my work. They're constantly saying it just living the dream of course i mean they really are a lot of them are eastern europeans who you know come over here and uh you know multi-millionaires <laughs> so. they're living the dream for real see around here it's ironic it's meant to just be like you know how it is but keep my chin up <laughs> which is better I, than what I, I do i work around a bunch of disaffected media types who would n never want to say something as cliche as living the dream <laughs> 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 that really makes me want to say it to them. <laughs> um, Slap and Sacks asks, see, I, I, I knew Slap and Sacks would be up in here. One of our first viewers, other than Henry, uh, what's up, no League of Legends? Oh, there'll be League of Legends later <laughs> today. Don't you worry. You get to see some bronze uh, shenanigans later on. So, uh, joined by David today. So, David, uh, do you want to read what you wrote? I will read the more read aloud friendly version of. What okay, I wrote. that's that's fair. That's fair. Um, so yeah, so the how Tracy Austin bro broke my heart essay uh, is, I recognize it because I've read it a bunch. I went through a big David Foster Wallace phase a few years ago, and uh, so I think this essay in particular has always stood out to me. I think about it a lot. If you're like me and didn't know, Tracy Austin is former tennis child prodigy who's rocketed to the top of the sport and was impeded by injuries, ultimately ended in a car crash. So David Foster Wallace, who is a great writer, also a regional level tennis player himself, was eager to hear what an experience like that would be from the inside. So he reviewed her memoir, her autobiography, or, you know, her autobiography. It was probably partially ghostwritten, but her autobiography. Um, and he was curious as to like, what, what is it like to be brought down tragically from your place at the top of a sport like that from the inside? What is it like to be inside that person's head? Uh, and unfortunately in the essay, we find that athletes are notoriously 
and articulate about their own process. We all see this on a weekly basis in the repetitive and dull courtside interviews at the end of basically every sporting event on television. You say things like, they just wanted it more than us. Or, you know, in the second half, we locked in, kept the ball moving, it worked out. Or just, I just have to keep shooting. My shot's okay. I just got to keep shooting. That kind of stuff. So Tracy Austin's memoir apparently reads exactly like this. According to David Foster Wallace, the entire book is a bore. And when she gets to this much anticipated section detailing her recovery from a career destroying injury, she doesn't offer much more than basic platitudes. Quote, I quickly accepted that there was nothing I could do about it. That is her <laughs> of how she reacted to having her her uh, national level tennis career ended by a car crash, which I think if I remember correctly, that that quote, David Foster Wallace talks about that quote, like haunting him after reading the essay. And the question that he reaches in his essay is, and again, quote, what if that statement is not only true, but also exhaustively descriptive of the entire acceptance process she went through? end quote. And whether this makes her, quote, an idiot or a mystic or both and or neither, end quote. Because although a more tortured mental process would have made for a better book and would have made for a better reading experience for Dave Foster Wallace, it's hard to say that it would have helped Tracy Austin all that much. The best thing for her to do would be to get, would be to set about the business of recovering. So the question I put forward at the end of the, not at the end of the email, at the end of this part of the email is, like sinking a game-winning shot or building a brick wall is the simple act of being human easier when left up to the sorcery of muscle memory. Yeah, that's wow. a great question. And that was the sorcery of muscle memory was a phrase from y'all's podcast. I didn't come up with that. Oh, okay. I know, I know. That's why I like I'm just thinking about all of the conversations we've had about that. Or maybe I think it was me and you for it. Well, the very first episode of this redu reduxed podcast was becoming human, and the idea that we're we're kind of living like as an algorithm, as a machine process, as a cell, you know, as a consuming uh, uh, metabolic organism. But there's how often are we actually living as a human? This dancing between these different parts and. When you get to the end, so I went back and found that that essay. Um, I'd forgotten that it was in this book. Um, I'm, I'm sure you can get it other places. Do you have yeah. this same one? Consider the I lobster. Have, I have that one and the the other one. Right. So consider the lobster and other essays uh, uh, by F David Foster Wallace. So, yeah, I mean this this is a really great thing for us. I think in the virgin Chad virgin versus Chad dialectic that's on the internet. You know the 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 virgin loser versus the chad like whatever um we're we're all kind of in one way or another both virgin and chad and so like these dialectics don't really get to the get to the point of uh this kind of frustration in the real world it's like she, in tracy tracy uh austin is actually the chad of tennis you know but she sure as hell ain't the chad of writing you know it's just so there's this, is it possible? And that's the whole thing that we're trying to do here is, is try to figure out how to bridge, I think, mind and body and try to find a way to be uh, Renaissance men and women, you know, like to, to be able to feel like we're not just um, checking, checking boxes on the one hand, feeling like artists, but <laughs> being able to eat too. And uh, so one of the one of the great things that David said in, to in, in wrapping up one of those was I was complaining about my first job to my dad, forget about what, and he listened to me moan for a few minutes, and then when I had finished, just said, "Well, I guess that's why they call it work because I think about that all the time." And something else you told me, David, was we were I think we were discussing Humphrey Bogart. Or you brought up Humphrey Bogart and how he oh, said. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, the, what's, that's the other, yeah, the two great quotes about work are the, that thing my dad says, and then Humphrey Bogart, who said, a professional is someone who does does the job better when he doesn't care. That's it. Man, is that hard for an artist to hear or an aspiring he's artist. Humphrey Bogart. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, it's, it, he's not like a cost accountant or something. No. And, you know, we went back and watched, me and Melissa, this last couple of weeks, we went back and watched uh, Rowan Polanski's Frantic uh, with, Humph uh, with Humphrey Bogart, Harrison Ford. 
uh, set in Paris. And it's him trying to get his wife back. And, you know, it's it's a genre film, um, but it's got that Polanski, like, something. Um, have you seen that movie? I haven't seen that one. It's, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what I think about it, really. But it was it was good going back and watching uh, Harrison Ford's craft again. Because Harrison Ford kind of reminds me of, of Humphrey Bogart in that sense. Like, he's just, he's the consummate professional. You know, he just, mm -hmm. he does the job. He's a craftsman. He is a carpenter of acting. And there are moments where you could say, oh, this is too Harrison Ford. And then there are other moments you just, you're like, no, nobody else can do this. Like, he's, <laughs> he's crap. He just, he has this thing, you know, the, the Harrison Ford je ne sais quoi. He's just a consummate professional. And um, I think that's one of the things that keeps people back, the aspiring artists, especially in the film and music uh, industries, from ever actually succeeding even to their own, by their own standards. You know, like somebody will say, oh, I'm an artiste, but then they'll turn around and, and, and watch something that contradicts that, that is extremely financially successful, you know, like. Well, the the person that, that comes to my mind when, you, when you're talking about this is Brian Cranston. I feel like he's somebody who flipped the narrative of like, like the idea of learning the rules like a pro so you can break them like an like an artist. A artist. Right. Well, he, it feels like to me, he went on Malcolm in the Middle and he broke them like an artist. And then he found something like I've seen interviews with him, man. And what makes him such a stellar actor is his work ethic. He just spent so much time learning and thinking and working on the script. He talks about hours and hours when when he's filming, like he goes home, he barely gets any sleep. He just he just studies the script, studies the character. And uh, and that just was weird to be thinking about Malcolm in the Middle's dad you know right. like he started off as an art it was more of an artist and then he just he got into something man and he just went deep into it and now he's you know of course he's he's an artist he's you know but that that kookiness of of uh, malcolm in the middle i don't know there's something beautiful about this artist you know uh, uh, uh brian cranston metamorphosizing from um from the butterfly to this like hardworking, beautiful worm. Right. Yeah. We were, uh, listening to a podcast with William Friedkin. He was a guest on, uh, this one, like movies podcast and Friedkin grew up in TV, uh, professionally. And so mm -hmm. back then everything was very produced. Everything was live studio audience. And so there was all this pressure, you know, to perform under the gun, you know, uh, and to get everything, working out and you know we already know just from from just working with webcams and like the the technical difficulties of doing this live like uh can you imagine like multiplying that times you know it's like a symphony it's like a symphony of all these different very mechanical technical things that have to hit at the right moment and so that's one of the reasons why he's such a consummate director uh we watched cruising last night for the first time which uh is interesting definitely interesting i <laughs> i don't know what to say about that movie like i can't like he he breaks some of my rules um so it, it just goes to show that yeah you can break the rules like a like an artist once you've put in that time and you know like if you ask michael um uh william friedkin who his favorite directors were they were people from the studio system which mm -hmm. we in our you know post post uh lucas or post indie revolution we often you know take a shit on the the studio system saying how it was all formulaic and programmatic but he goes back and he looks at guys like michael curtis and says that they were the the best of the best of the best because they could they could churn out movies and not make them terrible like they they were just they were so uh so methodical and so unsparing with the criticism of their own craft you know that they were always just optimizing uh, like on in a sense on a shoestring even though they weren't necessarily on a shoestring uh, my dad watched this me and dad watched uh, dirty harry i oh, know it wasn't dirty Harry. i'm sorry like after that he he uh we were in the movie mood and so he noticed this thing um it was like a tmc thing about uh cinematography and seeing those early cinematographers and what they did with silent film and how they like they had a guy one of the guys was sitting there counting frames. You know, he's like, 
he's keeping like a log of the frames and stuff. I'm just the the things we take for granted. We can do this stuff like we don't even have to think about hardly any of this anymore, you know. Um, and it is just uh, there. There's something the necessity can be the mother of uh, or the handmaiden of not just creativity but excellence, I guess. Any other th any thoughts uh, in in that sphere there, David? Sure. Um, yeah, I think I think what I like about guys like Curtiz and any of these people who we would say like who really I mean Kubrick is not a studio guy, but Kubrick is another guy who just mm. like I mean Kubrick could like build a camera. Mm. You know, he just understood like he understood on a very on a very deep level just the mechanics of what he was doing or spielberg who's kind of been on both sides of this or lucas who's kind of out on one end of it or like i mean any, like even all the people who we kind of admire are different levels of rebel versus whatever mainstream what would the opposite of a rebel be like a, yeah, you're right it's almost it is in a sense player. it's it's almost the traditional versus the per, uh innovator you yeah, know? sure. There you go. Yeah, and I I'm a huge fan of people on all parts of that spectrum, and I think for me I don't and I I hesitate to come in talking like some sort of so it's like I have had a very modest level of success as a certain type of video professional, but I don't think of it. I think of creativity as part of the job, right? Like that's part of what that's like the job is like I'm in. So I do, I do social media video basically. And there's a, it's a food vertical. So it's pretty specific. Like there's not a lot of, like, there's a lot of rails on that already. Right. Of budget and medium and having to think about platforms and having to think about like, well, it's all gotta be food related. And so like, there's a lot of restrictions on it. And like in that system, my job is to be creative. Right. Because that system needs creativity too. Right. And so that's my job is to be creative. It's not, I don't necessarily think of it as artistry because it's not, it's, it's, it's artistry in the sense that it's my personal way of solving these problems. Like I have a certain, I have a certain way of solving a creative problem that hmm. I guess makes me an artist, right? Like that's like the, the vision or whatever. Right. But my job is to find a creative solution and just like, an accountant's job is to balance your checkbook. And well, that, I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I, I would like push creativity as part of the work. Mm -hmm. I would push back a little bit though and say, cause I, that's the first thing I thought about because you're, you're a video guy and Ford's a video guy and I've done a little video. Like the first thing I thought about when in your little essay at the beginning, that I, li I liked it a lot. And I thought about doing creative things as a living and, um, there is a certain aspect of uh, what I thought about was uh, Jordan B. Peterson talking about creatives being the explorers, the discoverers of humanity. So, you know, finding new um, aspects to, to living and stuff like that. And so there is something about when we get paid for it, when we do it as like a function of our job, it's less creative in the sense that we're not, we're not risk. There's way less risk. And we're not opening up, we're not discovering or, or, or exploring new frontiers. You know, we're limited by, right. I, by, I th by certain parameters. I think the problem is, though, that we have, we have this idea that creativity springs from the froth like Venus, uh, when mm. in truth, it, I think it tends to spring from, uh, you know, a thousand, you know, it's a like Malcolm Gladwell thing, 10,000 hours of of fine tuning certain creative decisions in a limited environment. So mm. again, necessity actually being the mother of true creativity over time. And these things just like you get one little piece here of the puzzle and then 10 years later you get another piece of the puzzle. And so that when you actually see a movie that feels right and everything kind of coheres on screen, it's like, ah, like it's a eureka moment through a thousand creative little decisions uh, it's really, it's really not, it is punctuated equilibrium from the outside. It seems like a, you know, in the blink of an eye, everything changes, but it's gradualism in terms of small wins over time. And that's something that we can actually work on. And, and I think, so at the end of that essay, um, 
Uh, Tracy Austin broke my heart. I had written this, and so I'll just read it. It's just typical Ford rant. Um, and, I, and I'm needlessly mean here to DFW, to David Foster Wallace. Like, this is, I do not feel this way about, he's not an idiot. Okay, but this was a, a Ford rant, so just take it for what it was. At the end of his essay, he says this, and that those who receive and act out the gift of athletic genius must, perforce, be blind and dumb about it, and not because blindness and dumbness are the price of the gift, but because they are its essence. And so I wrote, Prisoner's Dilemma, Closed Ecosystem, Bullshit. Like an idiot child with an incredible vocabulary trying to describe the Amazon River Basin. One can summon moments of blindness and dumbness, a.k.a. focus, but it is not the fault of focus that athletes become addicted to its tunnel vision clarity. That is the problem of the subject, not the object. It is the fault of the idolater, not the idol. The emphasis on techne, he talks a lot about techne, the Greek um, they would, the, the person at the top of their physical game was like, almost like a God. They were, they were the techne, um, as godlike instead of technique or technology, the two things that we can actually learn. It's Humphrey Bogart becoming a professional, Harrison Ford developing his acting acumen. Those are techniques. They are not technes. They're not gods among men. They're just people who who did the mundane work over time. They learned the rules like a professional so they could break them like an artist. So instead of techne, we can employ technique and technology as performative process. Uh, the medium, instead of the medium versus, uh, so whatever, the medium is the message. Uh, so McLuhan said the medium is the message, but the process is the performance. And then I cannot read what I wrote here. In... in Oh my gosh. Incarnation renders idols moot. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think what what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a way to uh, dance across spectrums, to have a dynamic human existence that allows us to not just um, be, be professionals, but professionals who can create. The problem is a lot of us give up on the des the desires for our own creative vision when we do the hard work of the mundane stuff. And we just say, oh, well, that'll never happen. And I I've so witnessed that happen so many times, like family members, stuff like that. They had an idea for a book or a movie or, you know, music or something, but they just, they had, it, it hurt too much to keep the dream alive. Um, so it's like we, we need to have some sort of hot box or, or some, some embers, you know, to keep the fire going. But but it's really the mundane stuff. It's the Tracy Austin being able to say, I accept that there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> like, it's just, I mean, imagine the book of Job being literally like, Job being like, oh, well, yep. It, just time to go back to work. Like, the, that's the end of Job. Like, the devil's like, uh, wait a minute. Like, you're not going to have an ex existential crisis? Like, nope. I'm just going to go, uh, I'm going to go work in the field now. Like that's the end of the book of Job. Job is Ned Flanders or something. Right? <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that could be a whole thing. You just put Ned Flanders, like a time traveling <laughs> Ned Flanders, and he like incarnates as different characters. Like, whoop, whoop, okay. Well, well, I, mean, I mean, I guess to push back against David Foster Wallace's own point. Okay, I'm sorry. You're getting a little bit of static. Um, static? Yeah, maybe a, maybe a loose connection. Oh, now we lost him. Man, I wanted to hear the point. Uh, Abhi Shake asked what's going on. I'm not sure if Abhi Shake's with us anymore. We're talking about uh, an essay by David Foster Wallace called uh, How Tracy Austin Broke uh, My Heart. It's are a long back? story. I'll have to probably yeah, there you are. All right, cool. yeah. Um, I was gonna say to push back against David Foster Wallace's own point a little bit for the sake of discussion. Like he is a guy who clearly does not just shut off that voice, mm. and he also reached a certain apex of his craft, right? Yep. Like so, there's that too, where it's sometimes I, you know, we all we all have different roles to play in the thing, and. Foster Wallace was it, but but I also imagine he was he got to a point where he could control it, right? You know, because you because he's a he's a very disciplined writer. Definitely, I mean, you he's have not just like 
I mean, even with with the length of stuff that he does and the thought processes that kind of seem to go all over the place, like he's as a writer, he's in exact control of that stuff. Totally. Yeah. I mean, you can't write a book as big as Infinite Jest and be like flippant. I mean, that's a that's a monumental right. effort. Just well, and like you can read like if, if you if you enjoy this kind of stuff, like his grammar is so good and his yes. ability to manipulate the rules of grammar is so I mean, he's like a guy who understands it all the way down. Totally. He's like Kubrick where he can take a sentence apart and put it back together. Th- that's, you know? that's a good way to put it. Yeah. I don't know that. So he, he clearly found a way to somehow do both. And I guess that's why that's kind of what the genius is. Right. And he also committed suicide. Like, I don't know. Like, there's kind of, there's questions about this stuff to me where I don't, and, and I'm, I'm not being flip about it or even acting like that's some insight. It's just a, it's a detail that always, it's an interesting part of his thing. See, there's somewhere between the spectrum of Job and Tracy Austin where David Foster Wallace is, and I don't want to be. You know, it's like, yeah, I, I would rather be like we there are other people we could take uh, in, in, you know, encourage it or encouragement or inspiration from whether it be Kubrick or Lucas. Um, like that's who I take inspiration from. Right. Um, and but. so, you know, trying to find uh, that mastery of both the discipline. I was thinking about like, uh, you know, a cheeky way to say it would be like innovation through tradition. You know, that's like a cheeky way to say it. If you look at what the innovation that Lucas accomplished with the first Star Wars and whether you like Star Wars or not, like it is a monumental achievement, not just economically, but on the budget they had just as a as a as a work of art, as a work of ballet, as as a work of technology. Like it's way more uh, in my opinion. I don't know. I, I, I think you would agree with me, but it's way more impressive to me than Avatar. Uh, because they figured out low tech ways to to accomplish this stuff. And granted, I mean, yeah, I know. Like, I mean, Cameron is another Cameron is another dude for me. Where I we could we could do a whole you, thing about. I Cameron. think you, yeah, you do like Cameron more than me. I I uh, I don't know. Well, but, and there's so, but and but so here and here's the other thing, right? This is the other thing that gets complicated when you're talking about creativity. In terms of finding creative solutions to filmmaking problems, mm-hmm. Cameron is every bit Lucas is equal. Oh, yeah. Okay. Like, it's not even, I mean, like, it's just, I mean, those are two guys who have both s- sort of serially redefined the way we, we do this stuff. True. That's and true. so Cameron is an extremely creative guy. Right. When, you, when, you, when you're talking about that kind of stuff. And he's done it, like Lucas, he's done it on a shoestring and he's done it with all the resources in the world. He's, he's found creativity at both ends of the financial spectrum. That's true. If we want to talk about like people who reveal truths about what it means to be human, I think Lucas has a sees further than Cameron does. Right. And see that's and, oh, go ahead. like, I, and so I would say that, but I would also say Cameron is, better at just packaging his stuff. People sometimes don't understand what Lucas is going after, but Cameron always makes it very obvious. That's a good point. Like that. So it just, it's, yeah, we can define creativity so many different ways. And that's part of what makes it the conversation a little difficult. And I think that is, that is one of the problems we have. It's almost like we're at an, at a loss to critique things that we actually say that we like. You know, so that again, like my my attitude towards Cameron is filtered through the lens of Avatar. Um, But if you look at his whole career leading up to Avatar, like Avatar really was a culmination of so many things. Again, 10,000 great decisions that he made that made it possible for him even to do this, quote unquote, vanity project that was a blockbuster. I mean, it was extremely successful. Um, So. Yeah, it, uh, people get, I think, you know, that's where I do agree with Lucas. People can people say, well, I wanted it to be a White House. And Lucas, I wasn't trying to make a White House. And, and like you said, sometimes he doesn't necessarily communicate um, through his marketing to convince an audience of what his intent is. And people just mistake it. People just d- didn't understand the prequels at all. I think you're one of the handful of people I know that actually understand Lucas's whole mission and vision and goal for his art. Um, and a lot of people just look at it uh, and are dismissive 
and so many in so many of these areas are just dismissive because of like it didn't fit their their preconceived notion of what a blockbuster movie is supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Judah, were you going to say something? I, I feel like this. I think this discussion sort of finds its crux or like is most pertinent to music actually more than video because I feel like um, music is a place where the more technical you are, the better you can be. And there is only one outcome intended outcome. Whereas like video and stuff can function in other ways. What was the one intended outcome of? Well, it's like an aesthetic function. Right, like you're trying, you're you're trying to make a piece that is pleasing to other people, like j- just on its own merits. It's mm-hmm. not it's not functional, really, in any other way, right? Music, like you can't use it to. I guess you can use it to tell us uh, to. I was just thinking, like you, you can use a song to, uh, to do some kind of like a safety teaching or something like that. But you know what I mean, like. Yeah. Oh, it's hard, you know, it's hard to fit music in anything other than just an aesthetic experience. And so you can, I, I, it just feels like it's one of those things like you can put every bit as much of um, professional rules into it uh, as, as you can creative whatever creative, you know, like as uh, touching on the human experience opening up new perspectives on life. I think music bridges the gap because it's, it's one of those things like you really have to shut off your, uh, in my experience, you have to shut off your brain and let your fingers, you know, you have to turn on your brain at certain points, trusting your fingers to do yeah. what they've the muscle memory yeah so it's like a combination of both yeah it is. yeah so here here's what that, this is what this makes me that makes me think of as as it relates to stuff like writing and filmmaking is or like at least editing which is a lot of what i do and like and let's say let's say writing because it's the best example of what i'm trying to say if i'm saying anything of any value and if not we'll move on to something else um the when you say you shut off your brain and let your fingers do the work with music, one of the things that's difficult to learn as a writer is how to shut off your brain and still let your brain do the work, mm-hmm. you know, cause it's like, it's not just muscle memory. Like it's, I, we can call it, I can call it muscle memory to illustrate it, the idea of what it feels like sometimes, but it's not an actual muscle. It's like the same thing that does the thinking for you. And so it's not like basketball. Like I will go play basketball to shut my brain off for real because at that point it is just my muscles doing stuff. But when I'm sitting down to write, I have to somehow get into this weird like limbo state where I'm not thinking, but my brain is still doing all the work. Right. Yeah. That's see, that's interesting because Karm Diaz just mentioned on YouTube. Can we consider the role of luck in reaching a certain level of visibility understanding there are different types of luck where we can increase the likelihood of something, i.e. four types of chance. That is to say, not everything can be attributed to pure, hard, grit, work, dedication to the craft. So yeah. when when I'm playing live music with Anthony Peebles, or we've got a little trio, and so we are the, the amount of time that's spent on, like we, so he references something Carlos Santana said, and I'm just going to always talk about this because I, I have not checked the veracity of this quote, but uh, Anthony always mentions this, like uh, Santana saying something about like when you're in the zone, it's supersonic, holy spiritual, like the spirit takes over and everyone is simpatico somehow, like we've tapped into some like, like ne- other dimensional organism where we're on the same plane we were functioning as an organism, as a band or as a symphony or whatever. Like, and when you're in that moment, you know exactly what the other person is going to do and they know exactly what you're going to do. And it's just this, just wonderful give and take dance, this, the improvisation, but the the amount of time that happens, it's like, you know, you're lucky if it's 5%, if you can get it above 5%. And, and, the whenever you try to duplicate it like you try to do the same thing on the same song next set next show it doesn't seem to come back so like c.s lewis talked about that about like um 
having certain experience, and I can't remember the specific essay this was, but he's talking about like basically trying to recapture that experience that you had of transcendence where, where you met God. And when you try to duplicate the, the accoutrement, you know, the things that you had around your, around you or that mediated the experience, it doesn't work this next time. And so that's like in the line of the witch in the wardrobe, it's like, they can't get to Narnia the same way twice sort of thing. Um, and so the, what what does that leave us with if the if transcendence if mastery is elusive um and it does you know whether you call it luck like you basically there is that other like hard working phrase something like luck looks like hard work or something like my, that my grandpa used to always say the harder you work uh, the harder i work the luckier i get that's it and so yeah. now but it is like it is a combination it's not just like I think so, you, can, you can expedite the process if you're working smarter and harder, not just working, you, you know, like work yeah. smarter, not harder. Like eh, sometimes you just need to work hard and it's not going to be smart, you know? Yeah. Well, I think this is, I have a version of this conversation at work a lot where we're trying, because, because part of what we do is try to figure out what's going to be successful online. Right. Like there's kind of like this tea leaf reading thing that happens and there is a, diversity of opinions about how possible that is, right? Like, can you predict virality? Right. Basically is the question. And again, I, Cameron is my favorite guy to talk about with this because Cameron has made the biggest movie of all time twice. Right. Okay. Like, you know, and it's, and I, I do, I do think there's obviously like you have stories like movies that kind of bomb on or, underperform because like a blizzard hits new England when they come out. Right. You know, like that, or like a hurricane comes through or, you know, you have things like Lord of the Rings that kind of like hits a zeitgeist post nine 11 that it would never have anticipated. Or you have people winning the lottery, like George Lucas being in just the right place at the right time to be that pioneer. I mean, he was, I, he's obviously the kind of guy who, was going to pioneer something somewhere, but to do it that visibly, he came around in the seventies. Right. If Lucas comes around in the fifties, it's a different story. Mm, he's too early. And so there's all that kind of stuff. But I think to me, to me, that's the luck part of it is there, but it's not an interesting thing to focus on. Mm. Yeah, I agree. The interesting thing for me to focus on is like, what are the people, what are these people who make it all have in common? aside from luck, because like rarely do I see something and I'm like, well, I just can't explain why that's successful. Well, well, I think what he's getting at, what, what I've started, uh, so instead of thinking luck, I've started using the term kismet, you know, which is a Urdu Hindi word, meaning what we would take as fate or luck. And, mm. and the idea it's like, it's the fates you know, back in Greco Roman like uh, view, but they were tend to be a tragic fate. Whereas yeah. kismet is more like, God winking at you. And so when I watch, um, when I watch surf contests, you, I love surf contests now, even though I, I think the, the judging is kind of cumbersome and not always, you know, sometimes it gets political and stuff like that. I like it because it may be the hardest sport to actually like game because the, I don't know. That's that's pretty subjective to say, but it's one of the harder sports to game because the the playing field is moving and unpredictable, mm -hmm. and so there is an element to waiting for Neptune. You know, like you yeah. just you, you know the other guy. Like let's say the 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 favorite is being slaughtered, and now he's the underdog. He's comboed. He's got to get two waves, and uh, both of those waves have to be almost perfect scores, and then all of a sudden. For some reason, this wave pops up that's too close to the beach for the other guy to get. And somehow, like, it's just like this Whoa, eureka wave that it's like, Ka -gang! you know, it's just Neptune's like, here's your shot, buddy. And he gets that wave and then paddles back out and gets another one in a minute and a half and wins. And it's like, so I, I think that's one of the reasons why we like sports is because you get to see those kind of things happen but i've noticed it in surfing even more because there's this element of kismet this element of divine favor or you know supersonic holy spiritual where everything seems to like the way is made straight before you um 
Yeah, you yeah. Know, it's not like we're pining for those moments, but we are mastering our craft so that when that happens, we know how to surf the way yeah, proper. Yeah, right. You know, and I think the other word that I want to that I like to bring into it to help clarify what I'm saying. I think I think all of that. Yes, that all that's a very good illustration of of what uh, of, the other thing that I like to say is it may be luck, but it's not coincidence. Okay. Mm. Right, right, right. That's, that's, like that's a good way to put to, it. Okay. Like that's where I would clarify right. how I feel about stuff. Like, yeah, there's an element of uncertainty, but it's not a, it's never a coincidence. Mm. Right. But that's, that's good. And this is one of the things, one of the reasons why I think uh, trying to at least be somewhat of a polyglot, learn a little bit of other languages, like the other, because our, one language ends up like losing nuance and people just start shuffling everything into into one giant word that nobody can agree on what it means, whether yeah. that be pro progressive or conservative, you know, those are two, or, or liberal or, or conservative. Creative. creative, yeah, love. I was, th I was trying to think of a word uh, for uh what is like lacking self-awareness like one english word to do that self unaware mm. like what is it glib like no that's not really getting what i'm saying like someone who is so hypocritically unself-aware that they do something and not realize it's contradicting the, their very fundamental principle like that's the word that i'm trying to get at that. right we got that word we that, need sure. a word for that like and but i mean self unaware hypocrite it's like yeah hypocrite but hypocrite, no i know what you mean there's no it's there, it's a glib hypocrite, you know? Yeah. And, and so, like, so many well, of us are guilty of that all yeah. the time. I'm guilty of that. Yeah. That's so what we might have to do is kind of do what the Germans do, which is like make a combination of words that gets at what we're getting at. Right. Like a port portmanteau. Yeah. Um, like maybe we need one of those. Right. But so, so like the word. Like glibly unaware. Glibly unaware. That's like, that's you know, like that's. That, that might be how we have to do it. Sanctimoniously, glibly unaware. Like that's, the, yeah. Some person who knows this word is probably like clutching their head right now as we, <laughs> it's like some obvious. No, no, it's actually, uh, I've had discussions with, um, with some of my um, multiracial or, you know, friends. And uh, there, there are multiple words in, uh, it's, it's one of the biggest uh, blind spots in English or not blind spots, but it's like a big missing spot in um, the English language where all these other, like there's a Korean word concept that we're talking about right now. What's that? This concept that we're talking about right now is a blind the spot. word, the word that we don't have. Yeah. Like it, for, it's like either a blind spot or it, we just haven't developed the word for it, but like Koreans have a word for it. The, the uh, Romanian word for it is not, not, I think it's like naps and tiza or something like that. It's like, it's exactly what you get. There's, they have words for this, but for some reason, English doesn't have a word for it. And, 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 maybe, this, and this is why it's important to have like, why I'm adamant about cross-cultural communication. Cause like yeah. uh, Carm Diaz just said, yeah, Ford, what you said is more in line with what I meant by luck. Luck is chance probability in the random chaos of universe. And somehow it's when you play poker, you get this, like there are moments you just get where they, they just say it's sick. It's that was sick. It doesn't, it makes no sense like that. You had, pocket aces two hands back to back that is not fair it's not real but it just happened and there's just uh i watched uh, uh european poker tour barcelona uh the other day like it, it was a like leftover stream from about a month ago and so the final table there these these two dudes and the one guy's chip leader he's got the other guy dominated um and just bullies him just like he's got like nine two off suit and so a hand that's not going to win. And he's just bullying the other guy off of his better hands. And But the guy just can't, he doesn't have enough chips to call his bluff. You know, he's just like, mm -hmm. I can't, I can't say, and like, he's not willing to go down. And so these plays this methodical, boring poker for like a, an hour and a half. And then the dude gets king three. The dude who's being bullied gets king three off suit. And the other guy has six three off suit. And uh, the flop comes and it's king three, three. So the guy who's been bullied uh, has a full house, all like it is perfectly hidden. So he has a full house, perfectly hidden. The other guy has trip threes, three threes. So he thinks, oh, I've got this guy dominated. So the dude who's been dominated the whole time just checks. Like it would be so like you would be most people would would tell at that moment. They'd be like, oh, thank God, I got a full house. Like, but he doesn't break his composure at all. He's just like deadpan checks lets the other guy bet into him he calls it and then a uh six comes so the other guy now has a full house but it's a lesser full house 
And so the you know the chip leader uh, bets that bets and, the, and they even call it. They said as soon as that that hand came down, is like we're going to see the entire stacks reverse. Um, that right there is like, and one of the guys even said it's like the poker gods are coming down to have uh, sport with with the mere mortals here at the table. And that's you know that was the whole Greco Roman idea of fate. That re- you know if you go back and read the uh, especially the Iliad. The, the way that uh, the the gods just play with these people, like pawns. Um, <laughs> but what we're talking about here is, or it, like, it is the type of fate that is, it, it, it's the kind of fate that's from the dude who gets the king in the three. You know, it's like, ah, I worked so hard to get here, and now I got to play this right. Like it, it wasn't like a sure thing. Like if he, if he winked, if he smiled, if he over bet, the game would have been up. But he just, he kept his composure. He had done the hard work. He'd been the Humphrey Bogart, Harrison Ford, you know, master, master of the mundane stuff. So that when, you know, God comes with a silver platter, he's like, okay, he doesn't bobble it. You know, because there's a lot of times you see that 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 happens where it's like your moment. You know, it's hey, it's Mm -hmm. Eminem, man. Like when the moment, like your shot, your your big opportunity, and you you like trip on the way down the stairs. You know, it's like yeah, Yeah. you forget how to walk. There's actually go ahead. Okay, Um, yeah, I'm gonna go on a brief. This is gonna sound like a tangent, but I'm gonna loop it back. Sounds good. So, um, one of the top three to five books that has like literally like I could feel it changing the way I thought was the design of everyday things by Don Norman, which is just about design. It's about design. It's literally what it sounds like. It's about designing light switches and oven knobs and things like that. Right. And the the thesis of that book is there is no such thing as user error. (laughs) Like that's the thesis. So that's the thesis. So yeah, which we all know that that's not exactly true, right? Like that's, there is such a thing as user error. However, as a designer, the discipline of inhabiting a world where you bracket that out of the question right. leads you to better design. If you don't, if you if you don't look for the for that exit on your thought process, if you mm-hmm. say no, there's no such thing as user error, you bent you make better design. And so I think oh, if I, when I sort of like I think I have a tendency to dismiss the idea of luck or fate or kismet or whatever. Like whatever word we would find, I would dismiss that. Not because I don't, as a philosopher, believe in randomness or whatever, but because it's like it's not helpful to me. Like it doesn't help my process mm-hmm. as a creative person to to try to factor that in, because I would rather be like this poker guy who just got really good at playing poker, and then when the world decided to reward him for it, he was ready. Right. Oh, that's, man, that's a that's good, a. Dude fascinating aspect of what you do david uh well all of us to some extent uh, creativity when you add in search engine optimization you know like because so often creativity can be uh masturbatory you know like we're just Mm -hmm. trying to get our our opus out there uh when when but when you dig deep into search engine optimization it's it's like someone said uh google follows whatever whatever everybody likes first or something like that you know it's like it's like uh the the best advice i got is like make something that that people like <laughs> connect with people yeah, and i feel yeah. i feel like um art and art we can get like it's that masturbatory thing where where we just want to make what what we think is cool and we forget and i think that's what you're talking about Ford in is that that spiritual connections because really spiritual just means that connection that we have with humans with each other you know it's that connection that we can't really explain it's spiritual right. and uh we we it's that social aspect of it um ha- relational aspect of of art that is so important to success but it's so hard because we're because of our narcissism, you know, mm-hmm. yep. like can't see past ourselves. Like, yeah. Yeah. That is really good. So, uh, one of my favorite shows of recent memory is Silicon Valley HBO. And I'm going to spoil a little bit here just as a, as a kind of a plug for the show. 
uh, in, I believe it's the end of season two or sometime in season three. Maybe it's towards the end of season three. I'm not really sure. Uh, I can't remember. They all kind of run together. We've, we're watching it for the third time now uh, with my daughter uh, for her first time. So um, if you've ever done any work on the internet, this show is just... It, it's just it's almost too real it's just like painfully real um the jokes don't always land and stuff but the what it what it make what it gets wrong in some of its comedy it makes up for in in spades in terms of social commentary it's just like a documentary at, at moments there's this moment where richard finally designs this product uh the our main character designs this 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 website that he's been trying to design finally gets all his ducks in a row everyone's uh, loving it, they start testing it with with all his friends. Everyone loves it, and then uh, Monica, who is the venture capitalist handler of uh, that he's got, she's like, uh, you know, I don't like it. He's like, why? Everyone else loves it. He's like, she's like, I don't know. It just, I hate the whole thing. It just seems so engineered. And he's like, I'm an engineer. He's like, I know. It's like, um, maybe I'm wrong. You know, it's like. I'm going to tell you something I've never told anybody. I had an opportunity to buy Slack at like uh, before it's IPO and I passed. It's like, what? It's like, I didn't get it. It's like, what do you mean you didn't get it? It's like, I know, I know. I'm pick- kicking myself in the ass. I didn't get it. I don't understand. So maybe I'm wrong. So they, they go to market and everything seems great. Like they get 500,000 daily active, u- or I mean, they get 500,000 signups or whatever and they're all having this big celebration and he comes to her and he's like, um, so you might have been right. And she's like, what do you mean? It's like, uh, how many how many daily active users should we have? She's like, oh, I don't know. A good number would be probably 100,000. It's like, oh, wait, you're below 100,000? She's like, yeah, 15,000. She's like, what? You have 15,000 daily active users? It's like, uh, yeah, that's not good. It's like, no, it's not good. You're never going to get your round two funding with 15,000 daily active users. And then he, so he has this moment of realization. He's in it, like laying in a tub. And this has happened to anybody who's ever tried some gigantic thing where the pressure is really. It's like he's just laying in a tub with his clothes on. And his uh, business manager comes in and he's like, There is, there is a problem. Oh, see, how does he word it? He says, uh, Being early is the same as being wrong. Because the, the problem is he made a product that was so good, only engineers could understand it because it was so ahead of the curve. Everyone thought that it wasn't working, but literally the thing that they didn't understand was what made it good. Because what happens in the platform is you upload a photo to the to the cloud and it's not there. Like it just disappears because they're, it doesn't, they were like, oh, well, I uploaded it, but it, my, my data didn't change. He's like, yeah, because my compression is so good, you don't see it. I got well. I got a 4K video I just uploaded. Yeah, that's what my product does. <laughs> like, so you don't need it on your phone. It's in my. It's in my cloud. Uh, and so he had to do this like 10 hour symposium to explain to his focus group how it was working. It's just so. But that that thing right there is like there is if there's something being early is just as bad as being wrong. And I think a lot of times we are so tunnel visioned in our own craft. That we, like you said earlier, uh, David, I'm sorry, there's a really long rabbit trail to get to this point, but like you said earlier about Lucas, sometimes Lucas doesn't do a great job of explaining what he's doing. And so people look at it and like, well, this is stupid. <laughs> That's literally what the people in that focus group said. This is stupid. <laughs> it's like, I was like, well, is that, does that a reflection on the person being stupid? Or like you said, is that a reflection on there is no such thing as user error? Mm. that the actual user interface the actual product didn't communicate what it what it was trying to do yeah all right wait was that a question or was that a rhetorical no no question? that was a rhetorical question I guess. okay yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's that's all i got for that guy Rose says maybe luck is a dysfunctional relationship between probability uncertainty and chaos that's that's true like uh and you might even be able to throw another term in there like probability favorability uncertainty chaos and terror i don't know like Mm -hmm. you know you think about horror really is like uh 
uh, fate and chaos uh, conniving against you. And I think that's why so much of the modern world, what drives people to suicide or drives people to existential dread is it feels like a chaos and a terror that is beyond your control that you do not understand and is impenetrable. But the same, um, you know, JBP would talk about that with like, uh, with nature, like nature in her horrible aspect looks like Medusa, but nature in her good aspect, it, I think again, surfing is a good example of this. Like when you face the wave as it's breaking and you're right in front of it, you're in a horror movie. But when you're outside of that wave and you tap into that energy, you're living a dream. Like it's the same thing. A wave is a horrific thing if it's breaking on you. Or a wave is a beautiful thing if you're riding with it. And mm. so that's the 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 fate kismet, you know, dialectic. It's like it's the same energy. Um, someone was it you that said that in the. Uh, Something about the sun. Was that you? Uh, nah, I don't talk about the sun. What? Uh, I think you did. Did I? Maybe I did. Sometimes I'm not paying attention. <laughs> um, the sun. Uh, I think it like, was. You in? Uh, Maybe, maybe not. Why am I thinking about that? Something about the sun. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, so I'm sorry. This came from Twitter today. Oh, this is this is kind of pertinent. Um, okay, so Ulysses on Twitter. Uh, he says, he goes, um, he, he can be kind of trollish in his way of dealing with people. Um, I respect that. What's that? I'm just going to say I respect that. I, I think you would love I'm gonna, it. I'm going to put that out there. I, yeah, respect I think that. I think you would like this. So Ulysses' uh, s uh, string of tweets here. I've been negative and aggressive sometimes simply because I sometimes feel. I often feel it's the best way to get the truth through. I've written some mediocre stuff, and if I had someone with taste, as I now am, to tell me it was mediocre, I had been better right away. Cultivating a culture of friendliness and appreciation where we approve of what our friends do, no matter its quality, is the best way to end up producing mediocrity. We must be pitiless like the sun towards ourselves and our own. Pitiless like the sun. And it is, I mean, hell is what is powering our life. You know, like that, this, this giant broiling mass of heat uh, makes it possible for us to even exist. Uh, and so when we refuse to acknowledge, you know, the, the terrible aspect of uh, the thing that powers our creativity, um, we, we do that at our peril and we take and we become flippant. Sure. I, so if we want to just see what we can do with this image of the sun as the like part of the reason the sun is life giving is because it's in its proper place. Oh, that is yeah, that's very true. <laughs> Like if you want to, like if you want to use that image, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, it would be awful if we were there. Yeah, <laughs> but we don't put it. We don't put it right next to us. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> uh, Carve Diaz says, "Is David involved in design?" I'm a UX service designer, so was pleasantly surprised to hear him mention that book. Talk about the chances. yeah. I um, so not I'm not in product design at all, but I do. I mean, that book changed the way I thought about writing and filmmaking, and I approach video like i can i i now edit and write with the thought of like okay how is a how is a person how do they enter this piece what is the first thing they hear how does that lead them to the main idea how am i like i i do actually think not exclusively but design language is in my head a lot when i'm writing or when i'm editing right mm -hmm. or when i'm do, or when i'm designing a graphic like for a title sequence it's like well what would you know it does, does the, do the important words pop out? Do the, does it like, it's all that kind of stuff. It, much in the same way, again, that like David Foster Wallace has designed his sentences to work. Like, I think, I think you can, I think design language is mappable onto creative stuff or, uh, pretty well. Yes, definitely. Um, uh, it is kind of interesting kismet, the fact that there are only three people watching this and uh, there's a UX service designer that happens to be in uh, to mention yeah. to notice that. So, yeah, that's that's one of the reasons why we do this. This is really more about 
um, us getting the chance to kind of vocalize some of the stuff because I would never have come across that book. Oh, can you say that book's name again there, David? The Design of Everyday Things. The Design of Everything. Every, and I didn't. By Don Norton. I'm just writing it on the cover of my uh, <laughs> consider <laughs> Um, that's, this is me. As you can see how, you know, so how well boring. designed my life is <laughs> design of everything day things. It's great. It's a, it's a, I mean, it, it truly was like a, my, it, it was, a, I arranged my living room differently now, you know, it's like that kind of stuff. Okay. Well, yeah, I definitely need to arrange. My- <laughs> we got, okay. So what happened was last Sunday, we got our first, first job, uh, for, for, uh, my, uh, freelance video work. Nice. And uh, we got our first check. So uh, in celebration, we uh, bought stuff for the company. Uh, I got uh, Black Magic Pocket Cinema camera. Oh, nice! And so I am, I am excited. Oh my gosh, dude! <laughs> just, I looked at the first footage. It does. It has a. I think their own proprietary raw, uh, you know, file format, 4K, mm-hmm. and oh you know you re- it's just so refreshing to mm. be able to record it flat and it looks like you know just all muted in camera and then you get it back here and you can do so much with it in post oh gosh i feel <laughs> golly I know, this is yeah. it's been a 15 year like slog through the mire my friends oh man it felt so good this week so we got our first gig tomorrow i'm um, gonna get to use it and uh man feels good man uh, but well, anyways, that's why I've got all the, uh, the boxes just piled yeah, up. It's yeah, like, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm excited. Um, I want to get David's take on sort of something this graded, like something you said for it over and over again about about the next iteration of 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 creatives, uh, Filthy Frank and and all these guys who like are the antithesis of design being the next wave of of creatives you think like i are you talking about i dubs now of course the yeah. moment has kind of passed i dubs that's true and, and that's filthy true frank it, it's, it not yeah, it's right. not as relevant yeah it's not as relevant do i know who these people are uh filthy frank he would dress up in a pink spandex outfit uh pink guy is it was what he was so i don't know if you remember that whole i don't know how conversant or you, you you even want to be with this shit but uh <laughs> but uh there was the harlem shake and so basically uh, that that phrase sounds familiar. Filthy Frank as Pink Guy started that entire meme. Uh, he was the one that got it going, and but he he'd already had a, a presence online, and he just. I'm not going to get on the watch list for googling this, am I? No, no, no. oh no, 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 no. Filthy. Okay. Uh, the great thing about Joji, hold on, I lost my connection to the chat server. What in the world? He, uh, yeah, Joji, man. He t- because talk about a creative, so somebody who learned the rules, you know, like a pro. Yeah, he's he's a great kid. Uh, my my daughter re- like she that's one of the few like people she kind of fanboy fangirls about. Um, but no, politically he's not. I just dropped some frames. Uh, that's the first time I've had frame drop in a long time. Hmm. Uh, well, while you're talking about that, so so David, the conversation was about the the rebellion against design really and and i guess that was what i took about it uh we we were talking about these guys that would just do the most awful just random things you know just like a guy jumping into the frame saying i'm gay you know something like that just something like uh, like teenager internet stuff cringy stuff getting you know millions of views just doing these random but hilarious and why were they hilarious to us had something to do with the rebellious nature of it rebelling against design it was like jackass 2.0 but i i feel like actually more there's something more uh organic about it than Mm. jackass you know it was just it was something less produced um it was it was just pure i don't know i like you go back and watch hair cake it's just, it's a work of art. Hair cake is a work of art. Mm. Uh, is that the one where he's like, he throws eggs against the wall or something? Uh, well, yeah, they got How To Basic to join him. Yeah, How To Basic was part of that whole little milieu. I mean, it's mm. like it's like Adult Swim, but again, just something more, because it was YouTubers. They were actual, these are actual real solo channels that you know joined together for a collab. Hair cake, I think, is, is probably, is the uh, too many cooks of, of that whole that whole milieu 
Um, but and, and and may have been the pinnacle. Like if there was a pinnacle of produced YouTube content, like in a in a uh, in a manufactured way, and I don't mean that like in a bad way. Uh, I th- I think it was uh, video game high school. Uh, Phil, uh, Freddie mm-hmm. Wong's. Thing. I did see that. Yeah, and uh, so that was that was like the 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 last thing that really was done by actual YouTubers. Then it just became corporate controlled after that. Um, but after that, the the people to really take on the YouTube mantle was was that crew and Hair Cake. Uh, yeah, just yeah, you know, we just gotta watch Hair Cake. It's, it's perfection. But I, I think. I think it still stands in the in the sense that what it has transformed. I think the the big thing now is watching people like you look like H three H three Nigahiga. Everybody is uh, uh, Joe Rogan. It's watching people talk. It's like what we're doing right now. And there's nothing design is still rebellious against design. You know, there's nothing prepared. There's nothing um, intentional about it. It's just people sitting down. Well, I th- that brings us to the to a little bit more that I wanted to read um, f- from your stuff there, uh, David. Uh, t- t- yeah, I'm going to give a one sentence response to Judas. Question. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Let you move on. So yeah, I think I think you ha- you can have classical music and you can have rock and roll, and sometimes the way you break the rules is still part of the. Mm-hmm. It's not like design in the sense that it's not calculated, but some people just have an intuitive instinct for how to break the rules in an exciting way mm. is rock and roll like i don't know i think that i think there's a place for that and i think uh, it's i think it's good it's harder yeah. to it's harder to put a box around it but i still think it's intelligible so how much of that do you do um with 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 your videos with uh with the recipe thing uh well with the recipe stuff it, with the recipe stuff it's more about clearly communicating information in a way that's aesthetically pleasing, you know? So those are, it's like the clarity and the aesthetics, like that's kind of, um, with stuff that's hosted, it, 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 uh, it's like, it's like my, whenever I'm dealing, doing a hosted thing, my question for myself is how do I, how do I bring this person's personality to the forefront in a way where people can get to know them? And I can almost compress, you know, like when you get to know somebody, you kind of like their quirks. Mm Mm-hmm. So my job is to figure out a way to compress that getting to know you phase into like almost an instant where you just feel their personality on screen. Wow. And so that's, and so sometimes that it, sometimes you have people that that, re- that that requires or invites really getting in there and messing it with it. And sometimes it's just like, look, they're doing all the work and I just need to make sure I get it in camera. What's something, can do you have a little anecdote of something you had to do that you didn't think would work and it worked? Uh, something, um, a little trick or something? Not, I don't know. I don't know that I have an anecdote about anything that experimental. There, there have been time. So one thing that, and this actually happened with webcam a lot too, kind of where. So sometimes we'll put text on screen to like highlight a, a particular funny quote, mm. and it's interesting to me the times that that works and the times that it doesn't. Because sometimes it really underlines the comedy, and sometimes it distracts from the funny thing. Mm. And it's like the same tactic can work and not work and with web camelot we found there are certain characters who we could let the actor do a funny voice and there's certain characters where as soon as you put an accent on it it's like it killed it Hmm. and so so it's i don't have an exact thing an exact thing like what you're asking about but there definitely been times where it's like oh it's interesting that that doesn't work here yeah that's good yeah that's good what were you gonna say ford uh so i was gonna mention uh something that you wrote uh, that ties into this, I think, uh, where we are, are in this conversation. Um, sorry, I had something, my chat client broke down, so um, I'm having a hard time seeing chat. Uh, but uh, David had written, you guys have alluded to this in a few ways, but I think that one of the things our generation struggles with the most is a respect of process. We're hyper-focused on the results of whatever it is we're up to, beach, bod, movie deal, that millionth subscriber, but we don't train ourselves to enjoy the road we have to travel to get there. Surely this is a very human impulse, but it does still feel like a generational marker to me. It seems that many of the peers I know struggle with the day in and day out rhythm that that is, let's face it, a lot of life. Conversely, check this guy out, and you uh, had a link to the longbow dude. Yeah. And, uh, so you said this fellow's tattoo in the matching inscription above. Yeah, his- let's, let's clarify for the, the three people who are watching this who may not have seen the birth of the English longbow video. This is a guy making okay. an English longbow. 
Sombra by hand by himself in a shack in the woods with like axes and wood files. And it looks like it takes forever. So this is a person dedicated to a craft, whether or not people are going to be watching. Like, hmm. Yeah, exactly. And this is the the de the traditional, like, you know, growing up in Christian church definition of integrity. It's, it's doing the thing, you know, doing the right thing. T generally, I always thought of this in a moral sense, doing the right thing when no one is watching. But mm -hmm. this is doing the thing the right way when no one is mm -hmm. watching. You yeah, know? yeah. This is a focus on the process. This is the mastery so that when the cameras are rolling, y you're not just, you know, shaky or whatever because you know how to do you're focused on the task you're you're summoning uh what david Was foster wallace calls almost like a dumb you know uh uh ability to shut everything else out it's just you're focused on this one thing um so this fellow's tattoo and the matching inscription above his door are latin for do what you are doing it's a jesuit motto about mindfulness whatever you're doing do that and the jesuits have accomplished a lot the Bible talks like this. Adam was created to work. Proverbs says work is something to be done for its own sake and for God's. Whatever you do, do it heartily as working for the Lord. MLK talk like this. If it if it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Leonton Price sings before the Metropolitan Opera. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. One thing that makes me nervous about the question of holding on to what, especially but not exclusively for creative types, is that hope is often placed in the idea that we will succeed later and we might. But successful people over and over again have warned us that success does not bring happiness. David Foster Wallace is famous for talking about this. Tony Hale talks about it. Conan O'Brien talks about it. Lucas talked about it. Uh, but you know what does seem to bring happiness? Work done heartily and for its own sake. And so you mentioned the longbow guy. Um, yeah. So this is what I think is the future of YouTube and I think the future of social media. Uh, I think it's work done uh, what, how, how did you put it there? Work done heartily and for its own sake. Uh, mm. There's a there's a channel that inspired me last year when I was trying to do some, you know, learn a little bit more about this construction stuff because I was working in some reconstruction, and his uh, channel was Essential Craftsman. It's an older dude, and he basically had a time lapse of him putting together a ramp for his for his mom to get in her house, like on a wheelchair, and it's just. He sits there and philosophizes about work. So he has a voiceover and it's it's written, prepared, and I I just found it mesmerizing. It's kind of like a mixture of ASMR with uh you know I, like work porn, but at the same time I learned something from it. Like it was actually mm -hmm. constructive. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think that that if if we so the thing I'm trying to get from instead of like a performative procession like this parade of people who are doing things like performatively, we right. get, get back to process as performance. Cause then you're forced to fo focus on the finesse and the form and the function and the technique. You're not just sitting there trying to look like you're doing it. You're actually trying to do it so you can make the thing well, so that it stands on its own, whether or not the cameras are rolling. Yeah, I think that was one of the things. I mean, I love that Northman channel. The uh, for our friends who are watching, Northman is a, the YouTube channel that has this. And it's it's just like it's one of my favorite things. That it's one of my favorite things in media anywhere right now. I love that channel. And one of the things that's interesting to me about it is like these are videos that get a lot of views. They're very well made. I, as a filmmaker, really love them. But they they literally can't make those videos without these guys who know how to cut trees down with you know, hand saws. Like there's, there's no content there for the video. Otherwise it's not just like they're cool videos. It's like, they're cool because they're showing something. Mm. And it's like, I think it's a, it's, it's for me, it's a reminder that like the value of, if we like to go back to this idea about like creativity or whatever, it's like the value of the create, my creativity is really going to be most fully expressed when I'm articulating something someone else is doing. Right. Like when I, and I, I mean, I think I see that at my job, right. Where we will bring a person in and my creativity becomes about like, I need to make that person look good. Okay. You know, like, it's not about, it's not about like, Ooh, can I jump in front of the camera here and show off what I can do? It's like, 
it's like I, I now have been given a responsibility where someone showed me something cool or interesting or funny. And it's like my job to like not drop it on the way to making it a finished video. Mm, right. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, I, when I was into cinematography stuff for a while there before we went to India, uh, I was like cin American Cinematographer Magazine, stuff like that, and uh, Cineast and uh, another cinematography thing. And, uh, you know, a lot of times, w even looking at some of these message boards, they would bring up like a movie, like, say, I think the movie at that time that was like had indie cred was uh, Juno. And how they, they were commenting on how a movie like Juno is just overlooked for its cinematography. Nobody cares. Yeah. Like nobody's watching it for that. But the thing is, and so it is a kind of a thankless job because mm -hmm. it's basically your job is to get out of the way. And that's yeah. harder than people realize. Like that's the kind of mastery of craft that Lucas and Cameron understand. They Dude, don't Cameron. just... Yeah. Dude, oh my gosh, Cameron is so good at that. Yeah. Cameron, like, I watched Titanic. I'd seen most of Titanic in pieces on mm -hmm. TV, but I hadn't actually sat down and watched it until like maybe two or three years ago. Right. And it blew my mind because that boat sinks for like an hour. Mm -hmm. And the entire time, I know exactly where the water is. Like, I know how high the water level is for mm -hmm. an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Great. It's insane. Yeah. See, people it's don't appreciate it's impossible to communicate how hard it is to do that. This brings up what frustrated me about cruising last night. So basically, uh, I, I mean, I think William Friedkin is one of the best directors of all time, but he's not as good as Lucas and Cameron for that very reason, because he's trying to be an artist instead of trying to be a craftsman. He mm. has like he plays fast and loose. This is one of the things that bugged me about No Country in a couple of places because I felt like they were being a little bit cheeky. They were trying to be, they were trying to make set the mood for the for the scene. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll I'll forego that that attack for now. But yeah, I'll, I'm I'll, not, I, I will not join you in attacking. I, like I know, but there are certain things that I do feel like that they're they're being a little yeah. too, too artistic in that movie too. I love that's one of my favorite movies I, of all time. But and what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is the artist and because those guys are consummate artists, uh, uh, the, the Coens. Coens, yes, oh, yeah, um, sure, and Friedkin is too. But there is something about like suggestion through uh, ambiguity that happens uh, where the, he actually has different actors playing this murderer, so it's all like uh, who's who's targeting gay guys and. Mm -hmm. It's like you don't actually know who it is, and you do. And anyways, it's just kind of tacky, uh, and it's really more about being. It's more about the shock and the mood. And I, I get it. There's a place for that, but it it would be like if in Titanic, uh, Cameron just said, "Oh well, you know, we need we need to." up the tension in this moment so let's have the water at this level and then we can bring it back down later on and and i think that's what you're getting at is like his hit he, he is not trying to hit a home run with every single moment and i see artists do that a lot i am guilty of that all the time where i'm like yeah, oh man, yeah, yeah. i'm gonna just i'm swinging for the fences with this violin solo it's like dude there's a person singing right now shut the hell up like yeah. your your soprano line is going to stomp all over his singing, and I've done that yeah. before. I'm like, oh man, just just watch me take the reins here, man. I was like, shut up. This is not your job right now. Your job is to sit there and chop in the background and be rhythm guitar for all intents and purposes. Get yeah, out of the way. Yeah, I, that's one of my favorite things about Lucas, and I think Lucas expresses it differently than Cameron does. But both of them, and but Lucas in particular, I'll just focus on him. Like Lucas somehow attracts like these. Uh, unbelievably talented like john williams and ben burt and oh ben burt yeah like coppola and like mm -hmm. and, and uh was it doug chang is that is that was that the production designer for whoever the production designer for the prequels and ralph mcquarrie back in the day mm -hmm. like and he somehow and i would love to I wish he would talk more about this. Lucas doesn't talk about his process a lot. I would love to hear him talk about how he wrangles those people because he gets work out of these guys that like nobody gets out of them. Right. Like he gets like just the sheet, just the, if you ever flip through those books about like the production design of the prequels, like the amount of stuff that didn't make it on screen. Unbelievable. Right. There's like 10 movies of cool designs that didn't even get on, didn't even go through the camera. And somehow he creates this place where it's like he lets everyone else come in and just and like that's, go nuts. 
And that's the thing that I think we're trying to mine over the next, I mean, that I'm trying to figure out with this whole, you know, online endeavor is figuring out how human creativity, we can cooperate in it. And, you know, I think yes. filmmaking is the, is the, uh, is the highest form of human evolution of art from the ballet and the symphony and the, uh, opera it's taken all of those elements and and worked them together into this m monumental production um and, yeah. and what we have not figured out is the next step now that we have computers involved in this right. where where they're branching choose your own adventure moments with algorithms that that tech um so that it can actually free us up from doing some of those things that we don't necessarily have to do anymore because we have t uh, technology to do it for us but what do we do with that? How do we make how do we make a dynamic, improvisational yet uh, rigorous uh, art forms that uh, that learn that that have? It's just so difficult for the innovator to maintain the Lucas or the Cameron sensibility of getting the hell out of the way so the artist can do their thing, you know, so the actor can do their thing. Um, so the production designer can do their thing, like yeah. finding I mean, a way to coordinate all that, to conduct it, you know? I think for me, it's, there's a, and I, I don't want this to come off sounding like some sort of brag about it. I think it's just like the, the mindset is somehow I have to just remind myself to be humble about the whole process and remind myself that that's not my job. Yes. Which that kind of brings us back to like, and I, and the other thing is like, right. Like I also love, people who just can go nuts. Like I love Terry Gilliam, who is not like this, who does not talk, think like me. Right. And who doesn't talk like, like I love him. So I'm not, I'm not saying this is the only way to do it. I'm saying this is how I do it. Right. Where it's like the thing for me is I'm more like, I think more like Spielberg does where Spielberg will say he doesn't have a personal style, mm -hmm. which is kind of like, it's, it's sort of true and not, I, I know what he's saying though, where it's like, you see Spielberg kind of a pro adopting different tactics and, trying to find the best way to communicate a lot of different kinds of things. And he's not like Wes Anderson where he, everything doesn't go through a funnel to come yeah. out one way. For right, Spielberg. Right, right. Yeah. And I like Wes Anderson too, right? but I'm not Wes Anderson. I'm more like Spielberg. Yeah. Where it's like, I'm not thinking about my, my personal style when I approach something, I'm just trying to, I, I think about it in terms of communication. And like I said earlier, design. I was having a conversation with buddy Cole yesterday and uh, he's a movie critic. Uh, he does, he writes a lot of movie reviews and, uh, he's watched a ton of film. I mean, he's, he's very well, uh, see, well read. Yeah, I mean, he's seen a lot of stuff. So uh, we were talking about Bollywood, and and I was just saying how a Bollywood movie, the the word masala really hits at it. That it's it's kind of just this buffet where everything's thrown together, um, and that works or doesn't work uh, <laughs> depending on the film. Uh, but it's hard for outsiders to really get because it's a combination of a musical. Uh, a soap opera, a serial, and an opera, uh, drama and comedy, and it's and it feels like a tonal mess. And he's like, I like tonal messes. Like, I, if like that's what if they're trying to be a tonal mess, like I actually I, I like it. It's kind yeah, of I'm down with that. Yeah. You know, it's it's kind of refreshing. But but I said, yeah, but the, <laughs> when every movie is a tonal mess, you're just like you get tired of <laughs> yeah. it pretty quick. But I think um, there have been there have been many Bollywood movies have they've kind of threaded this needle and. I, I generally tend to think of Bollywood movies as uh, less than the sum of their parts, where there's just these mm. these songs that are so good, so rich, so colorful, not just in the in the visuals, but in the actual tone color, you know? And I, I, I just, I will watch, I will go back to a movie like Gudgeonie, which was a ripoff of Memento, which was a ripoff of another movie, like a South Indian movie. Like, I mean, not, Memento wasn't a ripoff of the South Indian The South Indian movie ripped off Memento, and then this movie ripped off that South Indian gotcha. movie that ripped off Memento. Um, and so it's basically, it, it's just kind of a pastiche movie. It shouldn't be that good. But I go back and I watch certain moments in that movie, and I'm touched. I just, I, I, it, it works for me, you know? And I think we need a little bit of that, that tonal audacity. I don't, it's just refreshing. And it's and like, we just need a little bit of that um, sometimes. Um, yeah. All right. A couple of things from uh, comments real quick. Uh, improbable one. Um, 
said congratulations on the camera. Thank you. I, I'm going to slow roll stuff out a little bit by little bit, just tests and stuff like that. And don't don't put it on a drone and send it. In the oh, air. I will not. I do. I got a <laughs> pelican. My first pelican case I've ever gotten. I'm like, I'm being really scared about this thing. I've broken two cameras already with drones. Like, no, this one's not going on a drone. Uh, Improbable one expressing his love for Joji. Human cake. I don't know if I actually saw all of human cake. I saw hair cake. I think human cake might have been too much for me. <laughs> uh, Carm Diaz, short attention spans and the attention economy with design almost hijacked, along with our biology and psychology to keep eyeballs on screens, make it hard to focus on process. There's I, no such thing as user error. Well, I think there. I, I think we have been so compromised by the post TikTok era that it's not just affected 14 year olds. Like my daughter has a, it's weird. My daughter has a longer attention span. She watches more movies than me. When me and Melissa, I'm like, Hey, I, I want to start watching movies again. Cause I've gotten into this TV show thing, you know, I've like watching HBO or Netflix and stuff. Um, and she's like, I don't really want to sit down and watch the movie. It's such a commitment. Like, we're both like that. It's like, uh, I don't really feel like it. And we just sit there basically scrolling through a menu looking at, like, what movies to watch. We can watch anything we want, and we just don't want to watch anything. It's like, yeah, I'll watch that sometime. Um, there's something that yeah, is insidious about the whole thing. Uh, and Karim says, and this is starting with children younger and younger now. The business model has to change to account for human impact and not just pure profits. Western story storytelling is more plot driven. Indian storytelling, at least in movie, is emotion driven. Hence the masala and why westerns have a hard time understanding it. I think there's a lot of truth to that. How about that? I think there's a lot of truth to that. And problem one, you got to watch Human Cake Man. The number of collaborators out of that video it feels like the most epic version of YouTube Rewind. And a, yes, like that's how collaboration should be in the digital era. I think is, and I think we're gonna get there. I mean, I, I, what we're trying to do here, you know, the the five of us, uh, ten of us hanging out, uh, really for me, I I hope it's been as helpful to some of you all as it's been for me. Just to be able to talk this stuff out, because I get to hear from David, like I said, about a book that I never wouldn't hear otherwise, and I and we can all bring something to the table, you know, like I can bring my Philip K. Dick love to the table. David can bring his David Foster Wallace and George Lucas to the table, um, and we can just kind of meet in the middle and and have conversations and not overlook again, quote unquote, mainstream things that suck, you know, because that's the that's the that's the difficulty for. Um, a master of the craft sometimes or an aspiring master of the craft you can kind of get so tunnel visioned and that's like me with Cameron I, I, you know after I got high and mighty because I didn't like Avatar and, and just was dismissive and um, and David what I appreciate about David is even though he's a master of his specific craft I do think you are I'm not trying to blow smoke up at your ass I, I feel like I, I've had, like in the past couple of years I finally had that that feeling of like oh I know how to do this <laughs> Right. Mm. It takes so long to get to the point. You're like, I, I and which is about right. I'm 30, <laughs> right? So I started intently in college. And I mean, that's like, it's like 10 years. That's about right. Like right. That, that, that sort of fits the Malcolm Gladwell thing. Right. Mm -hmm. That's true. And, you know, and again, like I, I like mainstream, but I, I think there's a lot of truth to it. Some things you just, it just takes time. I think we can undercut the 10,000 hours thing in certain areas thanks to technology but sometimes you just can't you have to fail you have to yeah, yeah. and here's another so orson scott card at one point was talking about writing and he said every writer has to write ten thousand bad pages and he mm. said some people have to write them all at the beginning of their career and some people have to write them throughout <laughs> their career. But every writer is going to write ten thousand bad pages. oh that is that, that was his true. formulation <clears throat> orson scott card another Reverse redaction favorite. Yeah, no, the the man. He, he's another guy who uh, isn't there to have, have you notice his sentences. He's another guy who's like, like Orson Scott Card has said, like children's literature is better than adult literature because you can't basically you can't bullshit children. Like See, that was that's not how he said it, but that was what right. he was saying. That's mm. my school of thought. Oh, of course, I get real purple though. I say that I'm like, I just want to service the story. I just want to service <laughs> you know the character. And then when I write my little essays, they're just like swinging for the fences. Uh, yeah, yeah. So but like that was that was Carr's formulation was it's not necessarily like you have to make all of your mistakes out front, but you're going to make them. So you may as well yeah. start. Yeah, that's, that's good. Like, I, that was kind of more like his thing. I, I hundred percent agree with that. So the, for the four people uh, watching, uh, yeah, just like start whatever the thing you're passionate about, like start working, 
on it. Don't wait for the great camera. Like I've been filming, oh, I have 30 hours of finished content up on YouTube. I am not a success story yet. Um, but I have gotten a lot of those 10,000 mistakes out of the way. And, uh, and now that I have the camera, I get to make some more. And just it's exciting, man. The whole process is exciting. And that's the thing that Lucas and uh, Cameron had. Uh, that's the thing that Mozart and Beethoven had. They were craftsmen. Like, those guys were craftsmen. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, Mozart had 500 or so, uh, you know, opuses. And like like you said earlier, Judah, like, sometimes we're just narcissistic. We want to see the stuff get out there. But that was that was not the intent. The intent was to master the craft, just absolute mm. devotion to the craft. Make so, the longbow. Make that the longbow. Be, there that, you go. that should be our, 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 like, cry to each other. Hey, make the longbow, brother. Make the longbow. Make the longbow. All right, last couple comments from Improbable One. Actually, we are referencing in this podcast. We are referencing Improbable One statement. What 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 was it? The 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 magic of muscle memory. What was it? The sorcery of muscle memory. The sorcery of muscle memory. That's, That's it, yeah. it. That was his. Uh, so so the convo on this podcast has been really helpful. Many valuable things made sense here that I myself was failing to articulate. Um, oh, interesting. Improbable One brings up Werner Herzog. That's funny because you mentioned Herzog in your email response there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing about how Herzog is like, if you want to be a good filmmaker, you need to learn how to pick locks and you need to walk a 40 miles with no shoes or like whatever. All this, <laughs> you need to learn boxing and all that kind of stuff. I and I mean, that. to his point, like, I think his, I mean, Herzog's a documentarian at heart. Right. But it's like, he's like, you have to have something interesting to put in front of the camera. It can't all just be about what you know how to do behind it. Like you have to, like, if you're not putting something interesting on screen, if you have nothing to contribute, then it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's another thing. I think that's, I think that I, I far be it for me to say what Herzog was up to, but I think that was kind of what he was getting at. No, I think that that's a fantastic way to do it. And, and it gets back to what we're saying here. It's about doing the work, you know, earn the right to be in front of the camera, like be, make the longbow, like have something interesting to actually put in front of the camera uh, that that your process is actually. So this morning, my son was watching surfs up. He's addicted to that, that, uh, that uh, Shia LaBeouf uh, vehicle, the uh, uh, CG surfing movie. Um, and oh, oh yeah, that movie's hilarious, <laughs> dude. It is fantastic. Okay, like I go back and I'm like, I'll you know I'll kind of shit talk it when I'm in my you know film critic mode or whatever, uh, you know my hipster critic mode. But then like there are these little scenes oh, yeah. that are just so good. Like it's there's this fun. scene where he's where uh, Big Z is showing Cody how to shape a surfboard, and this scene gets the mentor student relationship better than most movies ever do because. Uh, <laughs> the mentor is is constantly like no 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 you're not doing it right no no go like this like this and everything he's saying is 100% right it is it is surfing embodied in in the text like it's perfection like they totally get surfing in this moment um because it's it's all about finesse it's all about flow it's not forcing the issue um but he can't let go <laughs> of the planer you know he's he's got to kind of like micromanage and it's like it's so hard to communicate with them for the master to communicate in such a way that it com- that it bridges the gulf of experience and uh anyways from a you know from a mainstream film a mainstream cg uh kid film perfect yeah. well david it was great getting to know you i uh i am late for my uh other podcast i'm actually <laughs> I'm double streaming right now, uh, but uh, do, do you like fantasy football, David? Uh, not just regular football. Yeah, that's that's. Cool. I like watching it. I don't. I don't. It, uh, I've had to pick and choose as an adult what I'm willing to really get into the weeds of, and sports is one of those things I just kind of watch and don't okay. number crunch. Well, good words today, man. I got to go back to some of that stuff you've said and really mull it over. Good stuff. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. All right. Well, thanks, Judah. Final word here from Improbable One. The, the magic of genetic memory and sorcery of muscle memory combined with the randomness of creative chaos should never be taken for granted. So there you go. That's kind of a, that, that, that's, that's a good one. All right. Well, thanks, David, for joining us. Appreciate it. And uh, anything you'd like to tell anybody? You, you, you keeping a low profile on the internet? You, you want us to you want me to send you any traffic your way, or is there? No, I don't. Problem? Yeah, I don't have any. I, I I might have a project someday, but not right now. Okay. All right. Well, y'all keep your ears open for uh for David's work. Uh, he's a great craftsman, 
in the visual genre. And now that I have a camera, you know, maybe we can do a collaboration one of these days. Uh, I'll be down. Yeah, it's going to take, a, I'll probably take me another year to get my crap together. But, um, but yeah, we're getting closer. We're getting closer. Yeah. We're Progress getting, to success. That's right. All right. Godspeed. Thanks to everyone. Uh, we will see you 